All right. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Lane Christensen, and I'm coming to you from our FDA China office, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this meeting is something we initially discussed almost three years ago, so I'm you know, very you know, happy that we were able to pull this together and that we were able to do so with the help of SBIA and OPQ. I would like to specifically thank Brenda Stoddard and Adam Fisher for their effort in today's program and also their management for supporting this event. I hope uh, everyone has found this content to be very informative and will continue to do so. Hopefully this is the type of meeting we will be able to use more in the future. Uh, with that, uh, the topic I'll be speaking on today is an overview of FDA's international mission and the global manufacturing landscape. My intent over the next couple slides is to provide some perspective looking at our foreign offices, specifically the work we do through FDA's Office of Global Operations. This office manages our foreign presence across the globe in strategic locations. For the drug program, we will see later uh, where this is the case in, in specific regions. Currently, we have offices in various locations, including offices in Beijing, New Delhi, Brussels, and three separate locations throughout Latin America. Later, my colleague Chris Mindorf will be providing more information on some of the specific activities going on in our India office. For the most part, however, this slide illustrates the main areas that both our offices focus on. Uh, the first thing many people think of when mentioning US FDA is our presence through inspections. Indeed, that is the first, first bullet point here. And many of our staff in China and India you know, are dedicated to this type of work. Beyond that, however, there are three other general areas we are heavily engaged in working on to ensure safety, quality, and effectiveness of the products we oversee and are meant for distribution for the US. The second being collaboration with our Chinese counterparts. Uh, we have a very active relationship with China and NPA. Uh, we put together an annual work plan that focuses on previous outcomes and successes and focuses on how we can improve in various areas, looking at increased communication, cooperation, and collaboration, outreach and education to industry. Now, this webinar today is a perfect example of that, monitoring China landscape, and this is something the agency sees a lot of value in having individuals in country. Uh, we do this through you know, monitoring various issues, examples being the explosion of manufacturing facilities that will impact uh, their ability to produce you know, potential shortage products, uh, looking at uh, pollution shutdowns that impact manufacturing in given regions, looking at uh, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, manufacturing and drug supply chain. Uh, this information is, is pulled together through engaging with various stakeholders and in turn we share it with our counterparts at headquarters. Many of you will be familiar with this slide as it relates to how the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, the Office of Compliance, and the Office of Regulatory Affairs work together to ensure one quality voice and their mission to protect public health. I particularly like this slide as it is within the same space that the foreign offices also work with these distinct disciplines. Much of what we do abroad is shared with our colleagues to support them in their risk-based decision-making process for reviews, continued surveillance, inspection planning, and communications. Any strategy we develop or work we do in a foreign office reflects the interests of these offices and ends up being an extension of their priorities, further amplifying across the globe that one quality voice. Now I'll pivot to a snapshot representing our compliance activity for drugs over the past five years. I decided to exclude 2020 data as it isn't complete and will likely have a different story to tell when it is all over. This information does not reflect the total number of inspections conducted in each region, for example, as we see many more inspections taking place in the US than anywhere else and are seeing decreasing number of inspections taking place in Europe. We do, however, see good representation here where a lot of increase in compliance activity is focused, namely in the US, China, and India. I'll try to explain some of this further in the next few slides. This slide is just another way of looking at that same information, underscoring the fact that our operations are global. Our interests are global. The need for us to have a global outreach and work with various partners is more important now than we have ever seen before. During the relatively same time frame, this slide shows the number of import alerts that have been issued. An import alert is simply 
another regulatory tool that is used or there's evidence to allow for detention of products that appear to be in violation of FDA's laws and regulations and can be put into place rather quickly. I like to think that none of you are aware of the different designations of an import alert simply because you've never had one. Uh, the data here shows that the majority of import alerts issued have been to firms located in the Asia region. Here in green, 6640 is a designation for firms that have been found on inspection to not have adequately met requirements for drug GMPs. 9932, or the red bars, are for firms that have refused an FDA inspection. And so the question that is likely being asked at this point is what is going on and why? Uh, that was a question I had when I started observing the data a few years back. So in an efforts to answer that, we need to go back a little further. Just under a decade ago, the expectations were for FDA to conduct inspections at domestic facilities every two years. However, the same frank frequency didn't exist for foreign facilities. This caused a large imbalance of inspectional coverage as more and more manufacturing began to pop up elsewhere across the globe. To address this imbalance, Congress passed the Food Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, or FDASIA, to promote, among other improvements, a greater parity in our inspection coverage using timelines that are in accordance with their risk-based schedule. In addition, there was the expectation that FDA would also address the inventory of facilities registered with FDA that had never been inspected. So these inspections of the never inspected facilities began on or around 2015 and just finished in 2019. The outcome of that is what we have just seen in the trends for warning letters and import alerts. After a completion of inspecting all the facilities in an inventory that had never previously been inspected, here's what we found. The over-the-counter products or OTCs represented a majority of the firms on this never inspected list. In addition, a bulk number of these firms were found to not be manufacturing in conformance with good manufacturing practices and end up being recommended for official action indicated or OAI. You know, such an increase in inspection outcome led to the increase in regulatory and enforcement actions in the form of warning letters and import alerts. Over three quarters of the warning letters issued during this time were for OTC products. Common examples of these products as defined and regulated as drugs under the FDNC or Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act include certain toothpastes, acne treatments, shampoos, cleansing wipes, and hand sanitizers, and sunscreens, including makeup containing active ingredients for sunscreens. So now I want to take a look and share with you the breakdown of the most common issues seen for OTCs. FDA continues to see a significant number of GMP issues due to lack of data integrity. Now this is not an issue of specific product types, such as OTCs, or a given dosage form, nor is it specific to any region in the world. This has been an area of extensive outreach in recent years by our China office, the India office, and through the agency's updated data integrity guidance. Degrees of data integrity issues vary from poor lab data controls to outright falsification. The most common issues I've seen have to do with poor controls over computer systems and laboratory data, efforts of testing results into compliance. So I ask you, you that are contract manufacturers, API suppliers, application holders, testers, repackagers, you know, what are your vulnerabilities? And what are you doing to ensure that the quality of data being produced at your site? Facility and equipment concerns. Now, there are many examples of inspections conducted at facilities that have fundamental issues with maintaining a clean environment, controlled at adequate conditions, adequate storage and disposal of waste, using adequate equipment, and scheduling an adequate level of equipment maintenance. Now, under no conditions should these type of issues be acceptable. Lack of raw material and finished drug testing. Without this kind of fundamental testing, you do not have any scientific evidence or any, in, or any assurance that your incoming materials or final product conform to their specifications and are adequate or even safe for their intended use. Interestingly, there have been increased problems recently with glycerin in the drug supply chain. The FDA has had a long history of glycerin and contamination with diethylene glycol that has led to deaths. The requirements for glycerin are readily available in online guidance. And I refer you to that. And finally, contract manufacturers, a topic of much interest over the past years, 
There too is guidance on this that you should be familiar with, and I provide a reference later on in this presentation. The guidance states, FDA is aware that many drug manufacturers use independent contractors such as production facilities, testing laboratories, packagers, and labelers. We regard contractors as extensions of their manufacturer. You are responsible for the quality of your of drugs you produce as a contract facility regardless of the agreements in place with product owners. Upon seeing some of these fundamental trends and issues, I was reminded of one of the questions that was addressed by the FDA when the drug GMPs were originally published over 40 years ago. In response to the question that more or less came down to, do GMPs apply to OSTCs? The commissioner at the time responded, there cannot be different standards of quality of drug products for large and small manufacturers, nor can there be a different standard of quality for OTC and prescription drug products. In other words, whether you have an operation that employs five people or 5,000, whether you manufacture a complex generic, a biologic for breakthrough indication, or a topical ointment for tooth pain, the expectations to follow current good manufacturing practices is the basic expectation with which we should start from. This slide is to provide some more specific examples of the OTC non-compliance trends I mentioned earlier. Specifically, we are looking at issues over recent years addressed in warning letters for a firm's water system. As we all know, water is not just a basic component of many OTC products, but it is also used for other applications such as equipment cleaning. Many of the firms cited for water system issues were OTC manufacturers, and as you can see, these manufacturers are not located in any specific region. During the period looked at, it was determined that just over 15% of all the warning letters sent included issues with water systems. Many of the problems with water systems had to do with fundamental issues. The first example being improper storage conditions, cases indicating the system had been turned off when not in use, you know, heating, uh, water storage tanks left open being exposed to the environment. Uh, what about inadequate design and maintenance of the system? Examples include the presence of dead legs, multiple leaks, lack of sanitization, and signs of corrosion. Next, multiple examples were observed having lack of validation despite the system being in routine use. Regarding testing, uh, there were also multiple examples of failures to monitor for all quality attributes to consistently meet standards for microbiological attributes and the chemical attributes needed to meet the requirements for the purified water USP monograph. For data integrity, there were multiple issues seen of backdating and falsifying water sampling data. I also want to point out that most of these cases with water system issues also contain language about the responsibility of a contractor or a CMO, supporting the earlier slide listing trends for OTCs and issues with contract manufacturing. And the warning letter archives are rich with examples where owners has been informed and even received a warning letter for failing in their responsibilities to oversee the drugs being made by the contract manufacturer. So why did I present on compliance trends for non-inspected firms? Why did I address issues seen with OTCs? And why, why did I look at issues with water systems in the previous slide? Information presented in this slide is why. The slide addresses what FDA has seen in recent months with registrations since COVID-19 emerged directly impacting our drug facility inventory. Since March, our Center for Drugs has received registrations for over 5,000 new facilities. In China alone, the number of new registrations has more than doubled the total drug facility inventory we had registered at the beginning of the year. And this is a staggering number. Fortunately, we see that all this activity reaches peak in April, but it will have a long lasting impact on what we see on imports and how the agency responds to an entirely new round of non-inspected facilities during a time when we have stopped any inspections. What is driving all of these registrations is the interest around the world to manufacture and distribute hand sanitizers. Now, just a few months ago, I don't think anybody would have dreamed that we would be spending so much time on hand sanitizers. The majority of industry questions we have received in recent months at our FDA China office has been from companies looking for guidance on manufacturing and shipping of hand sanitizers to the U.S. I acknowledge that current FDA guidance 
exists on alcohol-based hand sanitizers implemented during the current declared COVID-19 public health emergency in the states. FDA does not intend to take action against firms that prepare alcohol-based hand sanitizers for consumer use and for use as healthcare personnel provided certain conditions are met. Those conditions outlined in the guidance include active and component formulations, testing, labeling, and registration requirements. Now, the problem is there are other types of hand sanitizers that aren't included in this, and more importantly, we've been seeing issues with alcohol-based sanitizers being imported into the U.S. We are receiving multiple reports of deaths and adverse events from consumers being admitted in the hospital linking to substandard hand sanitizers containing methanol. Now, our Latin America office is seeing a lot of this activity. Now, our office has shared information on hand sanitizer with our Chinese regulatory counterparts. I want to now share this information with you in this forum. FDA has been very transparent about our expectations, very transparent about imported product having been tested, transparent about issues they are seeing and even established a new import alert, a 6678 to address product that fails analytical testing at our borders. With all the registration and health concerns we are now face, not just in the US, but worldwide, we will continue to hear more about issues with hand sanitizers in the coming months. And for, for those of you looking at, to manufacture these type of products, for those of you that know colleagues looking to manufacture these type of products, please, please, please stay abreast of the available information. Share this information and do not add to our list, our published list of failed tests and recalls. I now want to provide a few useful references that have been either addressed during my talk or have been found to be of general good interest. The first being a link to how FDA now approaches the prioritization of risk-based inspections. The second is a document that has received much more interest recently now that our investigators are unable to do on-site inspections and are involved in requesting information in advance or in lieu of an inspection. I would like to point out that our investigators in our India and China offices have been and continue to be involved in requesting and conducting reviews of such records. The link in the last guidance is one I referenced earlier on quality agreements. So in summary, I would like to leave you with three distinct points. The first, FDA's foreign offices are committed to effectively advance globally FDA's mission to protect and promote the public health of Americans through working with our regulatory counterparts, working with industry, and working with academia. All drug manufacturers, including those that manufacture over-the-counter drugs, are subject to recurring FDA inspections and oversight based on risk and are expected to adhere to the same current good manufacturing standards. And finally, FDA remains transparent on requirements, vigilant on safety concerns, and will continue to take action when the significant quality issues arise. And that would also include for any quality issues related to hand sanitizers. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your time and your attention. Should you have any questions, please submit them and we'll be able to provide answers during our question and answer portion in this session. Should we not get to your question or you'd like to follow up offline, I provided the email address for our China office mailbox. Feel free to send your inquiries there. My time now is up and I would like to turn over the microphone to Alex Weeman from our Cedar Office of Quality Surveillance. Alex, the time is now yours.